Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. Uh, we're probably waiting for Jesse and maybe for Morgan. Yes, Jesse said he would be here. All right. Morgan, I've not heard from. Yeah. So how are you doing? I'm okay. Good. Um. Yeah, I haven't been spending as much time on this stuff as I'd like to. Um, I mean, for the same reasons I've said before, like if I, I have to spend so much time on my computer for my job that uh, it's hard to then go back to the computer right. when I, in, in my free time. Right. What about you? Oh, I, we just got done with the uh, Active Inference uh, Symposium, which was pretty good. Mm. Um, so we had some videos from that, but the live streams were very good. They had a lot of different topics there. Cool. Who's Jesse? Hello. Hi. Do you have any general updates you want to share, Jesse? Oh, I think mean, <laughs> my updates are uh, just uh under duress <laughs> i have like very little sleep unfortunately for like the third time in about two weeks uh which really is unpleasant i had a bunch of work uh just work stuff today and then grad school stuff earlier this week so i apologize for not really being uh fully functional right now, but I'm happy to listen and talk about this. Um, otherwise, I'm all right. Um, I, I put a bunch of updates in Greenish and Futures for other stuff. I'm, I've been thinking quite a bit about projects and, and things ahead, but I kind of have to just get through where I am now. And then um, I'm curious to restructure, not restructure, but like, I don't know. There's a lot, I, I, have, I have ambitions for the coming year. Um, and we can talk about them later, but um, that's it. It's been a busy week for me in, in other ways right now, but that's all. All right. Oh, I have to finish the, the thing. I'll send the email back to you, Bradley. I realize I didn't send the email, but it's all ready. Right. So, all right, yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, I didn't hear anything from Morgan, but we can just get started. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I read through this once. I didn't take good notes. Um, so I uh, may be a little underprepared, but it was very interesting. It started off, um, I thought the ideas started off kind of simple, like the problem was clearly defined, but then at the end, it, it was like, I want to say like it got heady, <laughs> like it was very <laughs> strange. Um, so we'll we'll get there. All right. Um, so the abstract reads: Many studies on memory emphasize the material substrate and mechanisms by which data can be stored and reliably read out. So we talked previously about how storage maybe be that maybe that's really just a metaphor and not a very useful one. Um, instead. Here, I focus on complementary aspects, the need for agents to dynamically reinterpret and modify memories to suit their ever-changing selves and environment, using examples from developmental biology, evolution, and synthetic bioengineering, in addition to neuroscience. I propose that a perspective on memory as preserving salience, not fidelity, is applicable to many phenomena on scales from cells to societies. So memory preserves what's important um, and what's um, yeah, most, most salient, most like definitive of a situation, not necessarily what's true, not necessarily like high resolution or all the details. Um, and then when you frame it in this first way of memory preserving what's salient, that introduces, um, like a dynamics because what's salient depends on the organism, 
um, not just like the type of animal, but the organism at any different point in time. Um, continuous commitment to creative adaptive confabulation from the molecular to the behavioral levels is the answer to, to the persistence paradox as it applies to individuals and whole lineages. I also speculate that a substrate independent processual view of life and mind suggests that memories as patterns in the excitable medium of cognitive systems could be seen as active agents in the sense-making process. So that, that's part of the papers where I was like, this is a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> the excitable medium of, of thought. I explore a view of life as a diverse set of embodied perspectives, nested agents who interpret each other's and their own past messages and actions as best they can polycomputation. This synthesis suggests unifying symmetries across scales and disciplines, you know, classic Levin goal, yeah. which is relevance to research programs and diverse intelligence and the engineering of novel embodied minds. It, it's very interesting, like, like, yes, classic Levin goal, but also, um, it's almost, I don't know if he talks about like inertia in the paper specifically, but it's, it feels like interestingly related to some of the stuff that, I don't know, I, I have this really clear thing in my mind and I realize I don't have anything written anywhere down about it, like, because we've been talking about memory for a long time now, but sort of the, um, there being sort of a uh, something held together across different domains across time. Um, and I'm really curious to see how that flushes out. So uh, thank you. Is this the, um, do you call it like the, the tracking problem before? Is that what you're thinking? You know, like, yes, that is something I've mentioned. And I'm not sure how that applies to memory specifically. I feel like there's something, I feel like that's like that's something, and I don't know what that is. Memory specifically, I think, is I guess it's I guess it's an evolution from like very not really my concept, I guess, or like my understanding, but like the convention of uh, memory as like storage, stored memory, you know offloaded somewhere and stored you know um but moving moving from essentially less of a transaction to more of a the re resonating across it so maybe maybe tracking tra tracking is definitely something and i don't remember what i was trying to go do with that specifically memory it feels more like or, or like the act of orchestra like orchestra orchestra conducting even though that's a very weird way to say it but but basically reson resonance across multiple fronts and i think it's really even just the, the way that it is in the um the abstract about why would would you know memory work differently for different embodiments because like the relevant at, at large interoceptive and environmental you know relations are are you know a a class that every agents have sure and like effect, basal effectivity of the internal stuff, the, the what was it, horizontal, the vertical causation, if you will. But like, still, there's this. Uh, I forget we talked about this last paper or not, but um, the matching of enough internal and external and other 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 things and i don't i don't think it's those matter it's just internal and external for the agent either but i'm i'm kind of rambling so we can move on <laughs> um so he, he starts by um introducing this puzzle of it's basically seems like a problem of identity um if a species fails to change, you know, it fails to adapt and it will die. But if it does change, then it's no longer the same species. So how do you identify um, a continuity here? And he says, uh, the, the solution to this problem has been process philosophy, which is a way of identifying the 
object as uh, it's something fundamentally dynamic. Um, so uh, what we read, I think it was Weiner. Yeah, it was um, Norbert Weiner said, he was talking about identity, um, maybe not using that word. And he says, an, an organism is more like a flame than a stone. So that's the basic idea here. So I've been saying something like that um, is maybe a, a solution to that paradox. Um, part of what it means to be a successful organism is uh, preparing for challenging external environments, um, but also dealing with changes of the, of the internal parts. Um, so, you know, illness, stress, um, there are going to be changes in the environment and also changes in the, the, in, the milieu, maybe. I know that's a technical term. Um, and adapting to both of those uh, is what makes a successful organism. So he's framing this question of, of exploring memory in terms of uh, this fundamental dynamism. He says, the essential unreliability of the biological substrate was a key driver of an architecture that is responsible for numerous fascinating capacities of the minds and bodies of life forms. Uh, here I discuss our nature as a hierarchy of essentially epistemically vulnerable agents who must interpret the actions of our own parts and information structures despite their being prone to error, decay, and autonomous behaviors. I argue that this is not a limitation of living things, but rather it is the origin of life's most unique aspects and of intelligence specifically. I provisionally call mnemonic improvisation the dynamic ability to rewrite and remap information onto new media and new contexts. So until that, when he starts talking about memory, um, the first part of this was also very familiar to me, um, just based off of all of his other all of his other work, this uh, hierarchy. Um, what does he mean by epistemically vulnerable? Like that your sort of your knowledge is vulnerable to your memory, or I, I guess in, in, in the context um, of what we're talking about. I took that as meaning, like yeah, this proneness to error. Like there's an imperfection in terms of the information, the storage and transmission. Um, so yeah, epistemically like dealing with knowledge. Um, so I thought that meant something like vulnerable to, to noise that could get in the way of perfect you know, knowledge transmission between these parts. Yeah. So I can look at the note too. Related to the concept of precariousness and to ideas on the relationship between the different kinds of disorder and death in living systems and the need for freedom from fixed interpretations of the past. Okay, so that's a little more sophisticated than I was thinking. I'm sorry, I barely asked a really interesting question and then I lost connection basically. Oh, I didn't reply to it. Um, the question was, what does epistemically vulnerable mean? So I clicked on yeah. this note um, related to precariousness, which I don't know if we read that Randall Beer paper, but he has a paper that's trying to like model precariousness, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. So yeah, basically imperfection in information storage and transmission um but that imperfection is is a feature not a bug like um there's a need for freedom from fixed interpretations of the past yeah it makes a lot of sense to me but um <clears throat> i definitely want to check out the randall beer paper too uh because <clears throat> And I think that's I think that's also like a key. I mean, we've obviously talked about you know DNA replication and change and mutation and all this stuff, but there's a sort of 
I, I think I'm sure he gets into that more in the paper, but the difference between basically biology, biological memory, or biological activity is, sorry, biological activity is basically, um, it, the, like the role that the role that it serves, the environment that it's in is one of having to, uh, sort of be non-fixed by default. And I know, uh, I know last paper we kind of talked about, you know, we're putting all these stuff back together again. And the, you could, you know, have burn damage and blow it up and put it get back together in very extreme cases. But there's also, I think, um, and and this is where, like, even some of, uh, Levin's like broader social ethical framework stuff, I think, comes in a little bit in the sense of like there's a certain, um, I don't know, uh, fluidity that's required. And I am I am curious to hear more or find out more. Like, how would it see yes as a as a feature and not a, a flaw of it, which I think maybe is open to like you know. I hold her a little bit what we would call far out, or like, I don't, um, I mean, a word I would use maybe is perhaps like cost of entry for being biological. Just like that. Yeah, let's, uh, I'll mute myself. Yeah, I think that the key idea is there will always be something to adapt to. And maybe there's like there, there's like a next level of you can't predict the the perturbations or like you you can't predict what you will have to be able to adapt to. So there's almost a second order adaptation that's necessary. Just like really extreme flexibility. Um so that memories aren't perfect, that memories don't like stick us in the past is necessary for that kind of adaptability, flexibility. Um, but nevertheless, memories serve as uh, a kind of cognitive glue. So they're obviously foundational to the, the continuity of the organism, um, but they have to be so in a way that doesn't trap the organism in the past. Um, he talks about caterpillar to butterfly. We talked about that paper. Um, so he says elsewhere, he focuses on this puzzle of, you know, what's the, how does the physical memory work there? If there's like no difference, no, there's no continuity between the, um, body of the caterpillar and that of the butterfly. Well, well there is, but there's like a really, you know, dramatic <laughs> dissolution of the structure of the body. So how do memories persist? Uh, but he brings up another point here, which is memories persist and what is remembered somehow is is interpretable and relevant to the butterfly body even if it was made in the caterpillar body so it's a, a different kind of puzzle than just um you know the the matter changed so much how did it oh jessica again. yeah um it's a different kind of problem than just oh the 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 matter changed so dramatically, how the memory persists, but it's also how to, like more co cognitively, I guess, um, how is this memory being retrieved in a way that's useful if it was formed by the caterpillar and now it's being used by the butterfly? Um, lots of citations. I appreciated that this paper, I guess like many of his, was about half <laughs> notes and references and about half paper. Yeah. Using the lens of memory and specifically the transfer and remapping of memories across space, time, and cells in very diverse biological examples, I developed two key ideas. First, that evolution makes problem-solving agents not solutions. Um, so organisms are ha have this like high level of flexibility, and that's what is um, 
preserved through evolution, not any particular solution. Um, its commitment to the evolution's commitment to the reality of mutation and uncontrollable environments, to the active reinterpretation of information on the fly, is a ratchet that gave rise to intelligence and cognitive selfhood. Second, the self is a dynamical construct, not in the sense of a misleading illusion to be eradicated, but in the sense in which all models are compact perspectives created and continuously maintained by agents under energy and time constraints. Viewing the self as an intelligent data pattern, which facilitates its own transformation, is a helpful con construct because it captures a core truth. While the details of minds and bodies change, thought forms, salient cores abstracted from experiences, remain and survive because they move across architectures that are able to interpret them in new ways for sense-making as a gestalt rather than committing to their details. So what is, what is remembered is this thought form, <laughs> um, a particular abstraction of an experience that is somehow interpretable by both the caterpillar and the butterfly. Thoughts are thinkers, as William James proposed. <laughs> yeah, so there's, this was the part that I was kind of, that what wasn't so, not that any of this was like so intuitive, <laughs> but the way he talks about agents, in, in other work, it seems like he talks about how like a single organism is composed of multiple agents. Um, and that's, Maybe it's just because I, the first time I really heard the word agent was in philosophy, which it, in which it very clearly means a person, <laughs> right. um, or like a, a person like animal or robot. Uh, so to to hear that thoughts can be agents was I haven't wrapped my head around that. Yeah, it it does remind me quite a bit of what I'm slowly unpacking regarding David Krakauer and his take on complexity science. Like, I, I feel like I, I would like to just put them in a room and say, like, okay, like, David, what, you're coming from this super high-level information processing stuff, and you talk about agency, you talk about teleonomic matter. And Levin's coming up, obviously, coming from the ground up in some way. But... Uh, it, that like that I I relate to Amanda's. I go I don't know I don't know if confusion is the right word, but like the the, the referencing and the, the usage of the terms um, in certain contexts feels like okay very much one way, but then uh, I I I feel like I can intuitively I don't know. I don't know if conjecture is the right word, but like put together, like I get, I get where level wants to go with it, but also at the same time, I think, uh, I think I'm, I'm perhaps uncovering in a philosophical way what, what a philosophical question for Levin in this case is like, okay, we use the word agential a lot, right? What, how do we differentiate an agent? Or agential and not agential AI is the whole like, oh, yeah. but like even in in the in the context of Levin stuff, where um, do we get to a place of, of explaining like by agential we yes. obviously aren't necessarily talking about a full um, person like a thought isn't a person per se, but do we mean that essentially? Almost in a, in a David Krakauer sense, like is 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 there this entity that is um, you know ex exuding teleological or at least inertial um, influence? And like it's it's like it's a like I, I think I think the interest, like the intriguing thing to me from like what I was talking about, like yeah, it's almost like at you know. The, the, the cognitive glue of the memory stuff is um, 
not sorry is not like is not a not of the nature of uh it it, it has an, it has it you could say it has its own agenda of let's say maintaining itself or at least adapting to different situations to preserve itself mm -hmm. but but you know are we saying then that all memories seek to like survive like is it a memory is it survival is, is this like it, we get into like selfish gene immortal gene territory about like well they want to live you know they want to you know act this way or what you know like 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 what what is the agential uh uh, anyway, uh, we can move on. I'm, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't be talking as much to like <laughs> walking around, but yeah. Um, yeah, well, so in contrast with this, the selfish gene idea, it seems like um, here the the sub agents, like there's a, there's a hierarchy for Levin and the sub agents are acting yes like in service of themselves in a sense like that's what it means for them to be an agent in a sense but they're also acting in service of the top organized organism the agent at the top of the hierarchy so here with talking about thoughts as thinkers um he says certain kinds of information structures actively facilitate their transformation and remapping in ever-changing cognitively excitable media and so I think I we would add like in in service of the organism who's navigating the environment, um, like the goals of the organism as a whole and the actions of the organisms as a whole, like uh, have play a role in guiding these structures. So it's not like they can completely go awry, and that's part of why I think it's. A little odd to call them agents because they don't have full agency. Maybe. I mean, this and this does lead us to kind of a theory of memetics, where we have you know maybe like memories that are sort of all competing for salience. Like you know, we lose memories all the time. We have stronger memories than others. On the other hand, he's suggesting that you have, and because you know this from kind of studying memory that. You know, there, there are things that go together. So you can remember bits of a, a scene or pieces of an event, and they all have to sort of be, sort of persist together. And I don't know, you know, I don't know, maybe that's something that needs more sort of a mechanism here, because it's, you know, you could both have both cases where you have sort of memories competing with one another, and then memories cooperating with one another to stay in this, give, give the organism this big picture. I don't know um, if he gets into that later, that kind of thing. I mean, confabulation, yeah, well, yeah confabulation yeah. would be an example of where you'd yeah. have memories competing and out-competing each other, sometimes maladaptively. Right, so the, the present state of yeah. the organism determines what the past looks like to the organism. So he says, confabulation is a kind of cognitive plasticity that emphasizes the present and the future and the just and the gestalt over the literal past. It occurs when a mind actively modifies and fits its belief to a current context, altering and reinterpreting memory data as needed to preserve various psychological elements in the story that it tells to others and to itself. And that's not so like the examples that he gives, confabulation basically means like like the the patient that confabulates the reason why they laughed is kind of, is wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> um but this dynamic aspect of the mind that he's saying is like it's not always wrong it's it's um it can go wrong but this confabulation is pretty central to how memories work Yeah. yeah, so he talks about split brain patients who, again, just kind of, they, they are wrong in their confabulation. Um, and he says that, yeah, this, this feature softens our connection to the ground truth of what actually happened in our history. Um, 
but I forget where he starts saying this, um, that is, that allows for this higher like adaptivity that is necessary for a successful organism. To recollect the past, we have to reconstruct it dynamically from the engrams left in our brain and body by the activity of a past self. One can think about our apparent continuous stream of cognition as a series of frames or selflets, uh, each one being probably a few hundred milliseconds thick. From this perspective, memories are messages between agents separated across time. The task of finding, go ahead. You know, I've been I've been sitting, I'm trying to construct a coherent comment that basically is um, exploring what, what the people he's trying to get at here. Because I've been trying to use this words like across time or like almost like atemporal sounds way too strong of a word. Um, but like like something that that mitigates time and associated like temporal perceptions um in a contingent way and, and like and, and for like i know as we all i don't think i don't think i didn't make this point here to us but like uh for, like further situating this whole discussion like relative to like i, I put in chat like as if they're all oh, soft and softens to connect into the ground truth and I think I think a lot of like the biological stuff, and a lot of um, you know, a lot of philosophical work. And I'm, I'm I guess I'm implicitly referencing my mind as a blank work, and and how we talk about the mind, you know, like mechanical stuff and machine, and the database, and the computer. Uh, like situating all of this relative to, like. The, the inherent process of what's going on is different. It's not as clear cut as 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 we have talked about it or prefer. It's easier to grasp when it's so clear cut. We're kind of getting into the more the symbiotic nature of the internal state and, and the contingent. Like I, when I hear cognitive blue, I think yeah, cognitive blue, but also almost like I think I don't I don't think glial cell is is good. But it's sort of this, this sort of fluid connectivity that reshapes itself across different, I guess we're calling it now self -less. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear more about what that involves. Yeah, and there's, it seems like there are better and worse ways of being fluid in this way. So he says the, the task of finding optimal meanings for memory traces is an exercise in intelligence and satisfaction of epistemic hunger, squeezing stimuli, whether from the environment or from one's past self for actionable wisdom about what to do in novel scenarios. Um, so that's just another like dimension of variation between individuals. Um, maybe it's a type of skill. I mean, this, this act of finding the optimal meanings for memory traces, that's obviously very abstract. So maybe one can be skilled in a certain kind of, when the memories are of certain objects and maybe less skilled when it's, a, there are of other objects, but it's, it's, so there could be multiple dimensions of variation here, but I thought this was interesting that uh, this is a type of intelligence. Um, it's like re remembering as a skill <laughs> and not just like, oh, how many digits of pi can you remember? But like how there's a skill in the confabulation. It's it's so interesting to think about that in terms of, say, like the, the super the super memory people, I forget what they're called, people who like never forget anything or like, they like oh they'll like just start associating okay on this day I had this and this and this and this mm -hmm. and then but it's it's always even then you notice like it's sort of a 
a conglomerate as opposed to just an individual slice abstract without. But I mean, I, 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 another point I was I wanted to make though along the line, so maybe we tangent to that, is um, what's interesting to me is that this, at least this is like personal, you know, feelings about things, let's say, but uh, what what individual humans remember is not uniform. What what is say like the the you know aspects of reality or or interaction with a, with other people or with the world are not uniformly weighted across. I would say these people and you go into like there's there's a there's a there's a, there's a, a I guess I'll use this from the theory in, in a sort of scientific field, but the, like psychological lopsidedness, which is basically all about this. Like we, you know, um, where I'm going with this is basically we, individual human beings may, may have very different weights for some of the information processing they do. And I wouldn't be surprised that's connected to memory itself, like memory as in the, the, I don't want to use words like affordance. I'm, I'm trying to find right words, but like the, the means that shape the connective like tendrils or, or pathways of the that which the ground truth of reality is connected to. So yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's kind of one thing I had in mind. At meaning when I said um, individual differences and dimension, like a dimension of variation. Um, yeah, so here's a little, I didn't find this figure very helpful at all, but when he's explaining selfless, um, basically just imagine a person's timeline, but represented in space and chop it up. <laughs> And you can call each one a selflet. Um, I, unless I missed it, he doesn't really, he like gave a number of milliseconds, but didn't back it up. I, I don't know if there's like anything interesting to say about what time scale. Uh, that's probably another um, individual, like source of individual difference is mm -hmm. if you had to chop someone up into selflets, what would the time scale be? Um, maybe if you think about like a a, organ, a fly, they like what see really quickly, right? <laughs> so maybe their selflets, though much less sophisticated in other ways, are like really really thin. Um, right. But a organism with like a much slower metabolism, or a, a some a creature that's sick or something would have thicker time slices. Like they're just not pro processing information as quickly. So. The meaningful chunks are wider. I don't know if that's useful. I I think there's a lot there already. Like like even in terms of, I don't know. I don't know how to personally feel about this, but I've seen people mention like, oh, well, you know, there are studies about how the perception of time is categorically different if you're younger versus older, and like some of that just because you have more references to make to it. You know, what is a little bit of time? I actually, actually, you know, it's really cool. I love, I love, I get to mention. So this fascinated me as a kid. I went to see a doctor, and I was, you know, like under, I don't know if I was ten years old or not. But I was like, oh, okay, how long is this, you know, symptom you've been having happen? He's like, oh, I don't know, a while. And he goes, well, you need to give me more than that, because he was, a, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a senior citizen and an older person at the time for sure. And I'd be, well, you need to give me more than that because a while for me is like 20 years. And as a kid, I'm like, what do you like? Wow, that's that's amazing. <laughs> like, what does that even be? You know? So I mean that's a that's a simple example, but I do think I do like even going back to the time thing, but also uh like I know Bradley's talked a lot about like sampling and yeah. and, and, and like sampling rates and the feed, you know, I'm sure you can speak to think about that. But like I, I, oh yeah, and the, the other connection I was gonna make was um, to basically, uh, I, I really wonder how, like, what, what would like, 
Barilla and Deprez and company say about this in terms of like I imagine some of the some of the um some of the uh, like did, did, what 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 individu individuates or what segments some of the the, the self looks is probably about um the ability to i guess it's called like letting go and I forget the framework for like like when when there are moments where you cannot or at least it'd be much much less in, in, you know tenable to get into the, the sort of reflexive get out of get out of the moment and be able to process i'm sure like there's a, a higher level uh categorization on that front too in, in a very virally and becoming aware gesture of awareness kind of stuff um but yeah we can move on sorry about the noise too but i'm trying to yeah, yeah. I, I hadn't thought about the on becoming aware stuff and like the different modes of awareness and how that could affect this. That's interesting. Yeah, so here's where he says that confabulation doesn't have to be pejorative. Um, we should abandon the pejorative connotation in favor of a recognition of the importance of sense making and commitment to adaptive function in the future over fixed meanings of past data. I propose that the necessity for mnemonic improvisation, the act, the active rebuilding of the content of any proto-cognitive system was the source of morphogenetic robustness and eventually conventional intelligence. The ability to improvise and make sense of your world in real time and the commitment to change, not just to persistence, over an allegiance to details of a, a past history form a fundamental biological strategy deployed at many scales with massive impact. Yeah. And, and I, I know I'm, I'm constantly saying this this whole time here, but like, I think I, I, I really, I really, uh, I was actually, uh, well, when it turned out, I was going to say, <laughs> even, even, even his, even his use of the word, oh, it's going to be pejorative. Like, I feel like this is another, like another subtle, maybe not subtle, but allusion to his like ethical framework stuff. Because I think, I think he's, I think he's very aware of, um, you know, we're, we're talking about this at a, a very technical level, but I, I think there's a lot of, I think, I don't know. I just, I can just see that, that certain conversation beyond that. Um, uh, he, uh, the, the thing I'm, I'm very often you know, repeating right now is just really further, further, I think offering kind of a humility, if you will, because we, as, as a, you know, fairly put together, I guess, if things are as like evolved or whatever we want to say at, at our, even just, even just at our relative stage of evolutionary development and, and various agential components of this, whatever, like what is for now, like we have this, I would even say, I don't know if privilege is the right word or illusion, but like we have this sense of, oh, we can choose to get in our head and go back in time and think about our memories and cynics. And I, I, I think he's getting at like this, this hasn't always been <laughs> You know, just an easily applicable choice for all like all the way biology has developed. Like it, that, it hasn't, it hasn't developed with that as our current vantage point and our current ease of having this like very nice like, if you will, like a graphical interface and the 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 all the nice features of, of making it user friendly to do so and the safety to do it exists now. Whereas back then, and then the development and development all components of it, that wasn't the case. And so the, the rule. The rules of the game and the rules of like what you had to do to exist and survive were quite different. And I think I think that's kind of, you know, I know that's something that Levin gets, and I think he's continuing to sort of build up that that argument too. Yeah, right. We didn't um, like organisms didn't always have the capacity to. To ruminate it's like a, it's a privilege to be able to 
mull over the past, um, in a sense. And then I, I love this quote. No man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. Uh, so I guess one one way of saying that what one way to explain how confabulation doesn't have to be pejorative and one point in favor of uh, not remembering details per like perfectly, that not being the goal of memory, could be that if if you are like stuck in your memories and you you see the river that you've seen before and you have high expectation, I do wonder how this, as a side note, how this can be matched up with pre predictive processing stuff and what they say about memory. Uh, but if you're predicting what you've seen before in the in the river, you miss novelty. Um, you you might miss things that are different about the river, and you also might miss things that are different about your own perception. Uh, so, yeah, I do wonder how like talking about prediction and expectation comes in here. Yeah. Well, yeah, there are a lot of criticisms of predictive processing. Um, I mean, from di well, not necessarily from this perspective, but yeah, we should go over that, like some of those criticisms at some point, especially with respect to memory or at least learning. Right. And, it yeah. seems in many cases, um, like Levin's basically saying, in many cases, it would be maladaptive to have strong predictions about something based off of memories of particular details. I guess not, it, right, it depends on the content of the prediction. I, um, I, I also, well, go ahead, after you're done, I have a problem. It, that just seems like one way of being stuck in the past, that's all I was gonna say. I, 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 what I'm about to say, I think, feels like they're therapeutic advice almost, and I say that with some irony, but also some, I don't know, uh, relevance for us, but like, I think it would also be extremely resource intensive to essentially, you know, like, are you gonna kind of like it in the, in the in the JPEG way? Like, are you gonna do low quality, high quality? Are you gonna go all the way to a PNG file? Are you gonna do something a bit not? Are you gonna go like really high level fidelity or not? Um, and, and like, I think, you know, like that's that's like um like there are, there are reasons why we don't like me as a person of a certain pigmentation doesn't just spontaneously you know in the middle of winter where we are now like, like the body isn't expending stuff it doesn't need to do because it's hard like the like living's hard and i think i think that's something that's so sometimes um easy to overlook but like like the, the actual energetics of it the, the and not just that, but like the cognitive to to pristinely preserve a specific thing, um, like that that in, a, in like a river, it'd be like trying to make a I don't know, like the watchtower in a river that will eventually get worn down, you know. And and I think I think there's something to that, like not just oh it's hard to carry the past, you gotta let it go. Like like I think there's there's like also just a you know the the constant returning to the presentness about it and, and the heaviness of it both like in a you know, oh it's hard to do, uh it's it's weighing you down, it's affecting your you know, our feelings in in, in, a, in a contemporary you know sense. But like I think the actual like the infrastructure to do that would actually be quite quite hard given everything that has been said here and what I've said before. Like it's it it's you're having to create something extremely artificial and unnatural. Like because that's not how anything in the environment around us works. If things persist, but like to to try to maintain a certain cognitive like snapshot of it, I think is like, like really much more radically different than I think um, 
is it might might be sort of uh, well, what's easy for us to 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 grasp now. Um, there would be a lot of just distance between the two things. So yeah, we can go back to. So here seems to be what I already talked about. Um, the caterpillar looks very different than the butterfly. So um, if you're talking about what gets remembered, it has to be at this certain level of abstraction, but it also has to be flexible in this way that he described when he said, um, when he quoted James as saying, the thoughts are thinkers. <laughs> the The memory has to adapt. The memory itself has to maybe change through the metamorphosis. Um, the right stuff has to stay constant and the rest has to change. Um, brings up planaria. Um, ant colonies as an example of a, an agent. So there are a lot of different substrates, uh, a lot of different things that can count as as agents that need to remember. Um, but he's trying to capture what's what all these different types of memory would need to have in common. And they're con continuous and dynamic in this way. Um, the right things have to be robust. The right things have to be flexible. It's not about finding a way to lock a memory in place and maintain its details against noise and perturbations, but rather it is about being able to remap, adapt, and improvise to extract the salience of memories into new contexts. Ubiquitous confabulation, and not just these stark examples seen in split brain patients whose language center con concocts a story about why their left hand was moving in surprising ways, is the central invariant across numerous phenomena in evolutionary biology, developmental biology, and neurobiology. Could you go back um, up to the... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Could you go back up to the part you were just talking about? Um, uh, is the... Yeah, number 20, uh, footnote 27 did by the, the, some, you know, buffering mechanism. So, yeah, it's... Uh, I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, another thing I noticed in the paper, you talked about Von Forrester. Uh, a couple times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw that too. It was going to like that. Von Forrester emphasizes the symmetry between foresight, hindsight, and insight. The key is not the passage of time, but rather the need to make some sense of the future and the past equally. Memories are an answer to what it's like to be the past me. <laughs> What is that citation? That, or he, well, he has 82. What is that? Oh. That could be a good thing to add to the list. I don't know if he can get a handle. Hand, it's like from 1969. So maybe, oh, wow. Well, he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't around after the mid 70s that much. But uh, yeah, that was, that's interesting. I didn't know he did uh, memory research. But yeah, maybe we can get that, get that at some point. But yeah, I, I think that's interesting that, you know, um, yeah. So this is a great. This, we're, I think we're almost out of time, aren't we? Yeah, we can okay. finish. Um, well, next week is Thanksgiving, so the okay. following week. Yeah. So some of these it's, figures are really nice. Like. Uh, yeah. This. Yeah. The self flits one wasn't really necessary. <laughs> um. Yes, his bow tie talk. So he starts to kind of get into the details of what this uh, condensation of memory would look like. Okay. Well, that's cool. Um, all right, here we go. Okay, that's it. Okay, so there's a hub, well, some hub in some, a network that kind of controls. So biomechanical network is tension controlling the uh, bioelectrical circuit. There's some potential controlling the, or gating things. And then gene regulatory network, you have some second messenger hub gene or protein. So I guess what he's saying is that there's the structure of networks 
that where you have some critical node that kind of acts to sort of bring all this together or ensures the compression of signals. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I mean, that's something we kind of know from like information processing that there are certain nodes in, in like in connectomes or in like metabolic networks or in gene expression networks or I guess biomechanical networks or social networks that have this sort of this critical nature. In other words, if you knock them out, you destroy the network or it fundamentally changes its configuration and what it does. So that's interesting. He's bringing this together here. Right. So the interesting question will be, how do these hubs um, allow this flexibility? Because it's not just a one-time compression, because then your memory would be uh, there. The question is, how does how do does it know what to compress, <laughs> right. and how is it flexible in this way? So next time. Yeah, yeah, and then of course it's like it doesn't know that, but it's just the configuration of the network that leads to that sort of cooperativity where you have things that are kind of dependencies and they're all kind of brought together in a way that's coherent, I guess. Oh, hi, Morgan. Hey. Hey. Sorry, I, I, I got in late. I've been just listening a lot. Yeah, no problem. We'll finish uh, two weeks from now. Yeah. Yeah, understood. Understood. All right. Well, uh, happy yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Talk to you soon. Take. Talk to you.